Welcome to the first edition of our Level Up series, Stroke Volume and Cardiac Output with Echo, Part 1. Let's introduce ourselves first. I'm Dr. Sarah Murthy, Director of the Critical Care Ultrasound Program here at University of Maryland Shock Trauma. I'm Alexis Salerno. I'm an emergency physician at University of Maryland. I'm Allison Langford, a fellow in anesthesia critical care. Allison is our guest star for this episode. Um, today we are starting a two-part presentation, actually three-part presentation on how to measure stroke volume, cardiac output, and systemic vascular resistance. Um, first, a little bit about what recess POCUS is. Um, it is the who, what, when, where, why. It is for anyone who's taking care of sick patients, whether it's surgeons, intensivists, EM physicians, or... OBGYNs. <laughs> <laughs> any healthcare provider who needs to help somebody who's sick. What we're going to spend uh, the next few episodes talking about. When and where, like all of point of care ultrasound, anytime, anywhere. Um, for complex patients after the initial cause of shock has been treated. Why? We hope that we can guide fluid, inotropes, and vasopressors together. So what is recess POCUS? It combines your clinical scenario, your physical exam, and echo to take care of your patient. It's more of a holistic, physiological understanding of what's going on in your resuscitation. Sometimes fluid and vasopressors, not two liters of crystalloid, and then norepi makes more sense or epi early with a low EF and shock may be better than adding it after the patient has, has been on high dose norepi. What? <laughs> Recess POCUS is based on the focused rapid echocardiographic evaluation or the free, which is what we do here at Shock Trauma. The main objective is to give physicians everywhere the ultrasound tools they need to manage complex shock. We're talking about more of a quantitative echo. In this particular set of broadcasts, we're talking about the VTI, the stroke volume, and the cardiac output, and cardiac index. There's more to echo and POCUS than just global assessments. What is the FREE? The FREE has measurements of cardiac function, volume assessments, systemic vascular and pulmonary resistance, and significant anatomic pathology as part of its assessment. Today, we're going to be talking really about cardiac function, specifically stroke volume and cardiac output, and how you can use those variables to measure the systemic vascular resistance. So what's the plan? Well, currently we're working on a website. We are making a phone app, so if you're at work and on your shift and you forget a formula, you can look straight on there. But to help introduce the topic, we're gonna to have a series of YouTube videos on how to do some use useful measurements. If you want new content or to help on this project, just let us know. We are widely available. We have a Twitter at RecessPocus, an email, RecessPocus at gmail.com, or just comment below on the video. So we're super excited for our first level up post. We're going to be talking about cardiac output, stroke volume, cardiac index, and systemic vascular resistance. This is part one of three. Um, we'll be talking about how you do the actual echo measurements that you need to make these calculations. So why would you want to measure cardiac output and stroke volume? Well, stroke volume is an excellent measure of volume status in and of itself. It's also how you can track your interventions. Cardiac output and cardiac index are the most familiar assessments of cardiac function. This allows you to talk echo with even non-echo people. So for example, Dr. Scalia, my boss, is super brilliant, fabulous man, but he's never actually going to do echo himself. So if I talk to him about VTI, he starts to look like I'm crazy. But if I talk to him about cardiac output and stroke volume, we're all on the same page. Um, and maybe most importantly to me is if you know the cardiac output and you know the mean arterial blood pressure, you can get some understanding of what the systemic vascular resistance is, and that helps you decide when pressors or vasopressors um, like norepinephrine may be helpful. It may be my favorite use of echo. So the data you need to do these calculations is the heart rate, the mean arterial blood pressure, the height and weight of the patients. You need the heart rate to calculate the cardiac output from the stroke volume. You need the BSA to calculate the cardiac index and the stroke volume index and the systemic vascular resistance index, and you need the map to get the stroke volume, the systemic vascular resistance from the cardiac output. That's all going to be talked about in some detail in part two. Today we're really talking about how you measure the stroke volume, and you need two measurements for that. You need the left ventricular outflow tract diameter, and you need the left ventricular velocity time interval. So to calculate VTI, you need two different measurements, LVOT diameter, or left ventricular outflow tract diameter, and your left ventricular volume time interval, or LVVTI. The LVVTI and um, outflow tract diameter are used together to calculate out the stroke volume. Once you have the stroke volume, you multiply it by the heart rate to get the cardiac output. If you know the heart rate, if you know the cardiac output, you can calculate out the systemic vascular resistance. Again, we'll talk about this in part two. So moving on to how do you actually do the measurements. Well, first things first, you need to get a good image. 
So to calculate the LVOT, you need to get a parasternal long axis view. You want to make sure you're in cardiac mode, place your uh, probe marker at the second intercostal space, make the indicator towards the patient's right side, and angle between the right side and the right shoulder, and you're going to take a look and get an image just like this. You're going to use your calipers to measure the 2D image, and you're going to measure it just inside the aortic valve leaflets, and you want to make sure that it's during systole when the uh, aortic valve is open, and the way to measure it really is a standard of leading edge to leading edge. So sometimes it helps to get a zoom so you can zoom in on that aortic uh, valve and you're going, you'll see like two little bumps before the aortic valve leaflets and that's where you want to measure. You don't want to be inside the valve or in the heart. You want to be right at that leaflet. Remember for the free you want to save a clip of the valve, save a still image of the open aortic valve and save your measurement. The LVOT diameter is usually between 1.8 and 2.2 centimeters. And what's really helpful is that it's related to BSA. So if you have a bigger person, you're going to have a bigger LVOT diameter. When we talked about the free method, it's an estimate. So we're estimating the LVOT diameter if we're unable to get this view. If a patient's BSA is less than 1.8, we're going to use a 1.8 centimeters as a left ventricular diameter. If the BSA is 1.8 to 2.2, I would just use your BSA. If the BSA is greater than 2.2, just use 2.2. And this really just simplifies if you are unable to get this measurement. It really should only be done if you're unable to get the measurement. The measurement is still the most uh, accurate way to calculate out the this, this stroke volume. So in summary, you have a LVOTD measurement. You do it from the posterior long axis. It's a 2D caliper measurement. You do it when the aortic valve is open, just inside the leaflet insertion, leading edge to leading edge. The normal values are between 1.8 and 2.2. It's very rarely less than 1.5 or greater than 2.8. If you're getting those measurements, you might want to remeasure. Patients with a higher BSA will have a higher, a bigger outflow tract diameter. We're going to turn this over to Dr. Lankford, who's going to discuss how we get the VTI. Go ahead, Allie. Thanks, Dr. Murphy. So the next important measurement is the left ventricular velocity time interval, or VTI. This measurement is obtained in the apical five-chamber view. The best way to obtain this view is either at the point of maximal impulse, PMI, or in most patients that are critically ill, you start very lateral in the fourth or fifth intercostal space with the point, pointer of the transducer towards the patient's left shoulder. For both the PLA and the apical 5 in intubated ICU patients, the heart is often more medial and inferior than it is in um, the outpatient echo lab setting. So you may sort of scan right and left to just find something beating, and then you work your transducer until you find the, the right spot. But it really can be almost anywhere on the left side of the chest in an intubated patient. So in order to obtain the VTI, you're going to use pulse wave Doppler. And there's two parts to this measurement. First, you're going to obtain the image. And second, you're going to measure the VTI. This is by far my favorite measurement. Um, I think it's the most useful measurement. And I just really like the blue flow from ColorFlow Doppler. So um, as most of you may know already, it can be super hard to measure in our patients. So if you apply ColorFlow, ColorFlow is actually also pulsed wave. So if you have a good ColorFlow signal, you should have a good pulsed wave signal. So you apply ColorFlow and you look for that cool rush of blue, and you know you're in the outflow tract. Ideally, you want to line the um, marker from your pulse wave right into that outflow tract diameter in that same area where you measure the diameter. Um, for the free, I would like for you to save a clip of it um, without color flow and a clip of it with color flow. So you're going to move the pulse wave cursor in the apical 5 view through the aortic valve. You're going to line it up parallel to the interventricular septum, and you're going to place the pulse wave gate just inside the aortic valve leaflets, just about the location where the LVOTD is measured. Again, the cursor is placed parallel to the interventricular septum so that it's going directly through the aortic valve. You may need to rock and tilt your transducer slightly just so that you can obtain this parallel orientation. 
And the most important thing is to be patient. This is not an easy measurement to obtain, but once you get it, you're going to be so thankful that you got an accurate VTI. The next step is measuring the VTI. So in this, you're going to measure baseline to baseline, and you're going to hug right along the envelope of the curve. You don't want to include any noise at the base of the curve. You um, have a calc package, Every, everybody, even if you haven't figured out how to use it yet. Al almost all of the point of care ultrasound systems and anything I think with pulse wave Doppler will have a calc package on it. You're going to open up your calc package to tell the package that you're tracing the VTI. Um, you just have to play with your system and learn your system because each, each package is a little bit different. So in summary, in order to obtain the VTI measurement, you're going to be in the apical 5 view. You're going to use pulse wave Doppler. You're going to place your cursor through the aortic valve and the pulse wave gate just inside the aortic valve. You're going to measure the VTI baseline to baseline and you're going to hug the curve with attention not to include any noise. You're going to select the largest best envelope for your measurement. And if there's if they appear irregular, you're going to select the average over 3 to 5 beats and most importantly, you don't want to measure if it's a poor signal because this is going to give you an inaccurate measurement. We've decided to add a part three of this where we'll go over um, pitfalls and when you should and shouldn't do the measurement. So now you know how to measure the alpha track diameter and the left ventricular velocity time interval. Congratulations! Yay! On to part two, calculating the stroke volume cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance.